you everyone for taking time out of your Earth Day to join us at the Seneca Park Zoo uh, for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and our Earth Day to You presentation. Uh, this is one of the programs uh, that we're we'll having today sponsored by Diamond Packaging. Diamond Packaging is a global industry leader uh, that is specializes in developing innovative and sustainable packaging solutions. And for years, they've been helping us with Earth Day uh, and sponsoring a lot of our donation of trees and our native pollinator seeds that guests can grab for many years. Um, and they, we have a pleasure of or bringing them back to sponsorship this year. And they are helping us with our virtual Earth Day today. So uh, we have reserved all the trees. Uh, they are not able to be picked up anymore. We have them all gone, unfortunately, but we do hopefully still have some sustainability baskets available at the zoo shop uh, for sale uh, to pick up this Sunday for a touchless pickup this Sunday. They can be purchased via our website at seticaparkzoo.org slash earth uh, and sales end tonight at 10 p.m. So please grab one uh, so that we can get those out to everyone. So today, my name is Dave Will. Uh, I was on earlier this morning, and we'll be looking at some macroinvertebrates today from a sample I collected this morning in our very snowy, uh, very confusing April that we're having right now, and I'm joined by Tom. Tom, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Snyder. I'm Director of Programming Conservation Action, and I run the department that Dave, Dave works for. So happy Earth Day, and thanks for coming today. I.e. my boss, so I'm going to be nice and put together today. Uh, <laughs> so we will be talking about macroinvertebrates. Uh, this is something that we love doing at the zoo and is a smaller program that really is by design, by asking if somebody really wants it. So what we do is uh, we collect macroinvertebrates, and it tells us a lot about the environment that we are studying and the small area around that creek that we are looking for these small aquatic insects, which is what a macroinvertebrate is. So I actually have a sample with me of a um, sample of water that I got from a creek in Seneca Park, and I'll be showing you that now. And Tom, give me a yeah when it's on the screen. It's up, so All this right. is our first time sharing from Dave's computer, so hopefully it won't, uh, won't freak on us. Yes, yeah, my home office, right next to my turtle tank. So we have a bucket of macroinvertebrates here. Uh, this is pond water that you see in front of you. I did no kind of filtering to this water. Um, when I collected the water, I did a couple of net sweeps, and that's pretty much it. And we see an isopod here in the bottom corner. I think you can see my mouse. And I had this covered so that and, uh, the macroinvertebrates would be swimming around, but of course we have everyone hiding at the moment. So when we look for biodiversity, and that's really what we're looking for with these small samples that we do through the zoo, and I see some movement down here, and these guys are moving over here. So we take a sample of pond water, and we want to really zoom down into that pond water to see all the different species and organisms that we are finding in a very small, small area. Um, my net is only about 10 inches wide, so this is a very small sample that we're collecting and a lot of life that we find in these very small spots. So as you can see, the first thing we do when we get one of these samples is I like to comment on the quality of the water just visually with my eyes. Um, this is a very clear sample. I have it in a repurposed bucket, repurposed bucket um, that has a white bottom. So it's very easy for us to see um, organisms moving around if there is any. Uh, and right now we do see a couple crawling through the substrate down here. And most of what we're seeing are isopods, uh, which would be a small um, aquatic invertebrate that is great for the food web. And when we collect these samples, we try to have uh, students, we have residents, uh, we have visitors to the zoo, we have people that come and help us out sort through these buckets and these samples of pond water that usually smell great, um, and then identify different species that are living in them, and then we section them out for different trays um, that we'll be seeing. So right now, just first glance on our sample, I'm seeing isopods moving at the top. We're seeing some isopods down here. I've seen a couple amphipods just kind of swim by in the bottom half down here. And I'm using a microscope, so I'm kind of zoomed in on the middle of the bucket. So along the outsides as well, we are seeing lots of macros. Hey Dave, uh, yeah. you said you said that the smells real bad, so that's decay, right? And and that's that's where we find most of the insects. Uh, yes. Why why is that? 
Yeah, so um, a lot of times, especially when sampling in a creek or a pond, you're gonna wanna look for little, teeny little micro habitats, and your nose can really help you out. Um, the nastier the smelling area, there's definitely gonna be something there. And as plant matter decomposes, as things enter the waterway and then start to be a part of the creek, uh, it is great habitat for a lot of these insects to lay their eggs and then to, um, to develop from there. So yeah, we smell a lot of great stuff. And it's not normally, um, you can't just use smell to figure out water quality, you have to do a lot of investigation. So I went through the sample this morning, uh, which is a lot of fun on my own part. Uh, and I got to pick out a lot of, of insects that we were finding in here. I didn't find too many. Um, I did have to break a little bit of, of ice this morning to get into my small creek that I was going for. Um, when we look through this, and I'm gonna move my microscope. I've been practicing this move for a couple days now. Expertly done, and I won't let anyone else tell me otherwise. All right, so what we have here are just a couple of the guys that I've isolated out of the sample we collected. So first up is a amphipod. Uh, some of you may have heard scud in the past, uh, shrimp, if you will. Um, these guys are very small uh, macroinvertebrates that live in our waterways and they're a basis for the food web. They're really great to find. One thing is though, they do, they're quite hardy, so they will live where the water can be a little bit more polluted. Sometimes they can live where the water is a little bit cleaner. And what we're looking for are those insects that cannot live where there's lots of pollution. If you find those in your waterway, then you know that the waterway is clean enough to support that life. So finding amphipods is very good for the food web and tells you that it's a productive creek, but may not necessarily give you water quality uh, information. And the same story is, oh, actually, Tom, do you have a close-up image? I do. We were let playing unsure, with this earlier. Let me unsure you, and yep. I'm going to go over. And it's going to actually show a something else first, but I'm going to move over and go to, there you go. Boom. So we actually did a program uh, back in 2015 where we did a lot of macroinvertebrate sampling. And then we would take those insects and then take really high res photos uh, with, a local, or with a photographer that we we're working with. And this is one of the photos that we took of an amphipod. And you can see they're relatively clear. Uh, we have uh, a lot of great swimming adaptations on these guys and they're very hard to find if you're a a uh, fish or something trying to eat them so it's very nice to find them in the in the waterway it tells uh, you that it's a productive creek dave Gen jenny race as well so translucent that's one of the things that was really surprising to me when i saw these is that you can actually tell what they're eating on um so you have different various things like green like this or if they're eating on a different type of algae um, it might be brown uh, inside them mm -hmm. so if we can go back to my screen sure you just have to share again. Yep, I gotcha. We're juggling. So you'll see ours are very clear and a little bit brown. Uh, the creek that I got them in is not the, the most clear looking creek. Um, and of course, this time of year, there's a lot of runoff and things happen. So the creek was much more muddy. So this guy is actually a little bit darker in color than the ones we were finding from the Genesee River as opposed to a tributary of the river. We're gonna move on to another bug that I found insect macroinvertebrate so these guys here are isopods isopods are very interesting to find as well most of these guys are clinging onto leaves and other detritus found in the water you're going to find them kind of hanging on to um, the bottom substrate where it's a little bit more sandy and rocky um, and that's where i found them this morning was at the bottom of a creek in kind of a sandy rocky uh, area of that creek and again, these guys are found in a lot of different places. Really good to tell you for production of your creek, but not really if it's clean water or not. Uh, very fun to find these guys, and it's interesting when they're wandering around. These are the ones you'll see most active uh, because they're always kind of moving and investigating their area. I did this morning. Very exciting. Um, found, and we'll see a close-up image of the isopod in a moment after I show you this guy. So That's we cool you found one of those. <laughs> yeah, we did let's, find one this morning. Let, let's ask uh, the people, the attendees, if anybody knows what this is by looking oh, at sure. it. Um, yeah. Go ahead and put that into the chat and we'll see if any of you know. Any uh, invert you, nerds. Give them a few things that they should be looking for to uh, yeah, sure. identify uh, that. What we're seeing is uh, legs protruding out the front 
of this, so of what we're seeing here, uh, to not describe it too much, uh, we see legs only in the front section of this macroinvertebrate, and then we see a longer aft section. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of body segments happening with this guy at the moment. Uh, it almost looks like he's wearing pants or some kind of shield or sheath on him, which may give it away. Um, and we see him actively kind of crawling through, and a lot of times they're just clinging um, to rocks or twigs that we find in the stream. I do have a, an up close that we can give uh, somebody here if you want to. Yeah, so why don't we jump to... We don't, have, we don't have any guesses yet, so let me see. That's fine. Here's, um, the, here's an up close, which probably has the name of yep. it on the top. <laughs> <laughs> about that. <laughs> it does. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yes, these are in the water. I found this with a real quick scoop of a net and a five-gallon bucket. Um, and this is a bug that creates a sheath around the backside of its body. Um, that is to protect itself from a whole different host of threats. Uh, one could be pollution, other could be predation. It helps with camouflage. Some of them do it just to lock themselves in place. Um, and they're one of my favorite macroinvertebrates. And I think we can just say what it is. Yeah. It is a caddis fly. Uh, two different species of what we were just looking at here. And, uh, its legs are very farther forward on its body, um, but the, the aft section of that bug that you saw, and I'm going to show you back on my screen. The aft section here, most of this is just gravel and other substrate that they found on the bottom of the creek and then solidified it to their body uh, through the use of, of some adaptations that they have to do that. Um, and this can be found with many different things. Sometimes we'll do a bug sample and you'll find a twig that all of a sudden just starts walking away. And that'll be a caddis fly as well. Um, sometimes it can be made of grass. Uh, we've even heard people taking caddis flies, uh, rearing them indoors and then putting jewelry down and very, very colorful bits. And then they make caddis fly uh, husks based out of those very shiny things and then they give them away to conservation. And, and they vary by species of what type mm -hmm. of substrate they use. Um, and one of the things I find really interesting to these is that they're very important for the trout fisheries. Um, so if you're seeing these, they need something called dissolved oxygen and really good dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, and, it, and so if you're seeing these, this is a great prey, prey item and, and base food web for trout coming if in. I'd yeah, if you're a trout fisherman, you're going to want to know this bug. This is a caddis fly. You're going to want to know this guy. Um, very good to tell us for um, better water quality. Yeah, they're going to want to live where it's nicer water quality. So finding these guys in our tributaries and in our Genesee River is great. It's great. Yeah, a lot Kim, of times... Kim what? is asking how many legs they have. Oh, yeah, six legs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Six legs. You see them poking out of there. Um, and then they have two hooks on the back of their body uh, that kind of create that that sheath that lets them kind of hang onto that sheath and stay in there. Yeah, um, and we are, Tom, why don't you show us those close-up photos once again? Sure. Yeah, so here's, here's the caddis fly that we were looking at before. Yep. And then if we move forward, uh, a lot of the other macroinvertebrates that we do find, uh, we have these images here that I'll show you now because we did not find them this morning. Um, this is a dragonfly larva. So a lot of times people see dragonflies flying around the sky all summer long and they are basically the uh, top guns of our fields. Uh, they will eat anything flying around. They're very insectivorous, great predators and a lot of times these guys will be found in the water before they emerge and fly around. Um, so a lot of times we find them around this time of year and you'll know that's what they are because they're very robust looking. You see three sets of legs and also uh, this photo doesn't show it but they have a mask in the front that's very intimidating looking that does eat other insects. So pretty usually, amazing. We usually find them on a vertical stalk, like a reed or something kind of hanging just below the water line. Um, and these are, these are really big predators of other insects. So uh, once they get to be adults flying around, they're, they're chasing down other food. Great, so that's dragonfly. How about this guy? So next up, uh, very similar to a dragonfly, only when dragonflies land, their wings go straight out. This guy, the wings go straight back, and this is a damselfly. Uh, we've probably seen these guys flying around, and you probably thought, oh, look, a dragonfly. But they're a little bit different, very, very similar, very uh, closely related, but yet different. Um, and this is one of the darter species that we do see around in the area. Uh, yeah, and then there's the, the larvae of the photo. Yep. 
That's the larvae of that one. So you'll see the difference between this guy and the dragonfly larva. This is much more sleek, much less robust, and very less um, predatory, for sure. Mm -hmm. And then we will move to the, no, you're good. And we'll move to the next photo. This is our isopod that we saw earlier. Again, really great to find these guys. Um, real good at just being a part of the food web in our area. And then I think we have one more. Do we have one more photo? Uh, yes, stonefly. Yes. Stonefly, yeah, one of the more ornate uh, macroinvertebrates that we do find in our area. Some real beautiful ones to find. Uh, and you'll really, it's funny to say, but it'll pop in your bug collection bin uh, when you do find some of these guys. And for me, I'm like, oh my God, that's really amazing. Um, so yeah, it's really fun uh, to find these stoneflies. So we have a really great mix of biodiversity in our area, especially down to the very, very small minuscule level uh, in our small creeks and streams in our area. I've even collected bugs on the side of the road in drainage ditches and in flooded lawns. So uh, one way that we're bringing this to you uh, and the reason why we're bringing this to you is because you can find small bits of biodiversity and, and wildlife everywhere you look. So turn over that log, uh, go in your backyard or go on your balcony, uh, look outside, even from the inside your house, you'll be able to see lots of wildlife out there. Um, and I found it with just a scoop of a five gallon bucket. And so Dave, Jenny Ray is, is, says that she's got to look closer, which is really, you know, why we're doing all of this. Yes. Um, and specifically, um, we know that uh, looking at this weekend, we have the City Nature Challenge. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? And yeah, I would love maybe, to. Maybe just uh, speak overall to, to what biodiversity is and, and sure. why insects are important. So um, we really like to know the differences of animals that live in our area. We don't like to see just one animal living in our area. So uh, we've had multiple environmental organizations all over the world actually come together on a single weekend to promote the biodiversity of each of their cities. Um, they've made it a competition because that's fun to make things a competition, but it's more of just a, a highlight or a showcase for the biodiversity of each city, which is very important. Um, very healthy systems have lots of different animals contributing to them. So it is very important for us to have high biodiversity. So in order to showcase that and to show all the different regions of biodiversity around the world, we have joined the City Nature Challenge, uh, which was started in California. Um, and it's a couple years old now and of course with everything going on these days we are still doing this but we're gearing it more towards a backyard observation so normally what would happen is we would get as many people outdoors as we can you would use a wonderful resource called iNaturalist uh, which is a really great resource that we use here at the zoo and then you'll take that photos that you take of wildlife and other plants and animals in the area and you'll put them up on iNaturalist and you'll be able to uh, get back information as to what that animal is. And if you do that this weekend, from Friday to Monday, take a photo of something wild in your backyard, something uh, plant, animal, green, something moving back there, uh, you can upload it to iNaturalist, and then we will see that aggregated into our project page, and then that'll all count towards our competition, which we are entering for this weekend. And if you look in the chat, I uh, put links to our one cubic foot survey that's on iNaturalist, so you can see all of the animals that we found in uh, 2015 when we did that survey. And then I also put a link to the City Nature Challenge this year. All you have to do is go sign up with iNaturalist. There's an app for iOS or Android. Um, and as Dave said, just go out and, and shoot anything that you can find, plants, animals, uh, right from your backyard. It's nearly 200 cities worldwide that take part in it. Uh, in Rochester, we certainly want to represent the biodiversity this year. Yes, and last year it snowed sideways uh, on the weekend, and then this year, everything going on. So yeah, we're going to see how well we do this year. So just be safe, but get out there as best you can, backyards, uh, driveways even, uh, and find, that, find those plants and animals. Great. And I think that's what we have, unless there's any other stressing questions in the chat. Yay bugs is correct. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we'll be doing this, this method of, of sharing microscopes and bringing these uh, wildlife samples uh, in the future, moving forward as we kind of adapt to a changing education climate. Uh, somebody asked about bigger animals. Yes, yeah, so Dave, why don't you give the, the rest of the programs for the day if you've got the list. Yeah, yeah we have a real exciting one happening at one o'clock. Um, 
my colleague of mine, Annie, is going to be uh, talking about animal enrichment experience uh, involving baboons at one o'clock. So feel free to join in on that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I've seen some stuff happening with that, and that's going to be great. Um, and then at two o'clock, you'll be back with me uh, to be a local conservationist. We're going to look at some camera trap photos uh, from a program that we run through the zoo. And then at three o'clock, we have a talk uh, that is Earth Day Today, where we can find hope in nature. So I'm very excited about that as well. Uh, and that has Drew Lanham uh, joining us, who is a uh, ornithologist. Great. Yeah, so uh, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, we hope to see you at one o'clock, two o'clock, and three o'clock today. Uh, we will make the, the videos available um, either by the end of the day or today or possibly tomorrow morning uh, for all the sessions. So you can come back to SenecaParkZoo.org slash earth uh, today or tomorrow and uh, they will all be updated. Well, thank you guys. Take photos of wildlife for us. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks.